Bereans being more noble-minded than the Thessalonians because they examined what Paul taught. They, they, they received it with, with encouragement. They, they received it well, but then they examined it carefully to see if what he taught was true in relationship to the Scriptures. So guys, that's what you need to do with everything I've given you this week. You're sharp folks. I think in, for the majority of you, the Holy Spirit of the living God dwells in you. Don't be afraid to look at my material and say, I think that's true. I think that one's false. Okay? And I wanted to say that before my answer to this question, because the question came up, what about if, if you're angry towards God? People have loss, don't they? People lose loved ones. People get sick. Boyfriends and girlfriends break up. People divorce. Kids lose parents. I mean, there's a lot of loss in this life. And so it's easy to get mad at what we perceive to be God's not loving us the way he should love us. And so I'd like to go out on a limb here, guys, and tell you this. I believe everything that comes your way has either been sent directly by God or allowed by God. Okay? Can I say that again? Everything that comes your way has even either been sent directly by God or allowed by God. Now, I've had people get very offended by that and say, but Fred, what if something really horrible happened to Joan? Somebody attacked her and raped her and killed her. That wouldn't be from God. And I'd say, well, I, I don't think that's from God. But could my God have stopped it? How many think that God could have stopped it? Well, then, if he didn't, what's my only option? <laughs> Is to believe that he chose to allow it. And so, guys, <clears throat> I have people all the time say, Fred, I'm just angry with God. And I don't mean to be glib on this, guys. I really don't. But I do always have the same response. And how's that been working for you? How does that anger towards God, how's that working? Because I haven't found that it works very well at all. One of the primary things we believe as followers of Christ is that we serve a good God, that he's good and can be trusted, and that he's way more intelligent and knowledgeable about what's going on than we possibly can be. And so, guys, I'm not going to tell you that I wouldn't cry in the event of loss, but I think I could tell you, I've lived 53 years, I have no intention of being angry. I serve a good God. His plan is good. And the deeper we grow in Jesus, the more that will, that will take place. A, a verse that I'd like you to write down, or three verses, is 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, 16 through 18. <clears throat> and it says, Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks. A number of years ago, I was just a seminar speaker at a Navigator retreat. <clears throat> the main show was a guy named Jim. And uh, I grew to love that guy over the next three days. This guy was deep. He was just a rich guy in Jesus. And he had woven the story of a, a wayward son of his who had fallen away from Christ and how that kind of it had affected his family. And he wove it through several sermons that he gave us. And it was just, a, just an impressive weekend. And then on Sunday, it was the last message, he said something early in his message that made me think, this kid he's talking about is dead. I thought, no. And so I listened to this very godly man just give this wonderful message, and then he came to this point, and he said, and my son had called us on the phone and said, I'm going to return home, Dad. I'm walking with Jesus, and I want to see you and Mom, and I want to be restored. And he said... He was going to be home on a Sunday afternoon. And he said, we came out of our house, dressed in our, our church clothes, and we'd no sooner gotten halfway down our concrete path to our car, and my best friend pulled up in his car, and he got out, and he said, I knew it wasn't happy news. And he walked up, and he said to my wife and I, I am so sorry. Jim Jr. was killed in a motorcycle accident coming back. And you could have heard a pin drop. And this godly guy, I just, I thought, I got to know what he did. He and his wife knelt on the concrete steps and thanked God for this new set of circumstances. This is living in Christ. Is trusting Jesus in every circumstance. No exceptions. 
and those that appear to be good that are, and those that appear to be bad that are good. Romans 8, verse 28 is real profound. It says, For God causes all things to work together for good for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. No exceptions. So can we be angry with God? Oh, I think there's going to be times when we are. But I wouldn't stay there long. It's neither good theology nor is it good for the soul. Okay, guys, if you turn the page. Well, actually, we're still on page 75. <clears throat> Saving, how to save your marriage by yourself. There may be some folks in this room right now that this, this applies to. And all I did is, guys, is plagiarize a chapter from a guy named Ed Wheat in The Love Life, one of the two best books on marriage I've ever read. The other one is uh, Larry Crabb's The Marriage Builder. They're the two best that I've ever read outside of the Bible. And we're not going to go through all of them, but I'm going to show you the first five. Prepare for the battle of your life. Clarify your thoughts. Your goal is to please God in everything you say and do. I love the fact that Dr. Wheat says that. Stabilize your emotions. Trust in what God says and not what your feelings are telling you. Kind of sounds like my buttons, doesn't it? Learn to love. Memorize and meditate on 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Wasn't that interesting how Kim today talked about meditating on that passage of Scripture for 30 days? And guys, they really are the real deal. It's, it's just so fun to watch them. Number four, prepare for the worst. Things often get worse before they get better. That's been my experience. And number five, prepare to be rejected. Don't become the desperate salesman. Never beg. We had a saying in the insurance business, no one buys from a desperate salesman. No one ever does. So you never want to beg somebody to be with you or to give you their love. That's counterproductive. Now, practical suggestions for those who have been in your shoes. Guys, these are some of the most practical things I've ever seen written as far as being that spouse who cares about your marriage and the other one doesn't. And so I hope you'll use that as homework because they're just profound. Now I'd like you to turn to page 76, and we're about to wade into some deep weeds theologically. <clears throat> but we're not far from the end. Down at the <clears throat> towards the bottom, it says historical note. Now, guys, I am not going to try to sell you on my belief on divorce. First of all, I don't think that's good form. Second of all, I am in such a minority position on this that I, I feel very uncomfortable trying to sell anybody on it. So did you hear me? Fred Nelson has the weirdo, wacko, fringe view on divorce. Almost nobody I know does. Okay? But I'd still like you to listen to me. <laughs> Historical note. Until the writings of the humanist Desiderus Erasmus, it was almost the unanimous view of the church fathers that there was no scriptural grounds for divorce, and that if divorce should occur, there was positively no scriptural basis for remarriage. Ambrose Starr, a Latin writer of the 4th century, was the one dissenter to this view. Now, guys, that doesn't prove anything. But I do find it interesting, don't you? That for the first roughly 1,500 years of the church, divorce and remarriage were not considered an option. That's kind of interesting. Okay? Desiderius Erasmus was a Bible scholar, but he was also, by, by his own admonition, uh, a humanist. And he had watched his mom in, in a terrible marriage and became very angry by the church's stance that she should stay with this abusive husband. So a little of his opinion was colored. He began to write vigorously against a guy named Martin Luther, and I guess you'd say he won. Okay, So that's just a little historical note on the concept of divorce. Okay, Thoughts on that? Okay, now the next thing I worked on very hard, because guys, I'm in a situation where I basically service people from all over Yellowstone County and every different church you can imagine. And I, I really am quite good friends with literally dozens of pastors, all of whom have seminary degrees. And I'm an insurance peddler. So guys, please keep that in mind as we discuss this very important topic. 
After 35 years of study, I am embarrassed to say that I still have no firm and final conviction regarding either the Bible's teaching on legitimate grounds for divorce or if remarriage to another is an option in God's eyes. Now, did you catch that? I have no firm foundation. Consequently, I have chosen to be charitable to the many different views on divorce and remarriage that are held by those in the body of Christ. All I would ask of my brothers and sisters in Jesus is that we would not so glibly or quickly recommend divorce as a solution to marital problems. Do you catch that? Now, here's what I believe has happened in the church. 500 years ago, we decided that someone could divorce for two reasons. Desertion by a spouse or marital unfaithfulness by a spouse. And that was described from a Greek word called porneia. Porneia. Now, that's part of our problem is that the word porneia can mean several different things. Now, before we go any farther, I want you to know that I do not in any way ever judge a divorced person. Divorce is not the unforgivable sin. I love them. I care for them. When divorced people come in and say, Fred, would you consider doing our premarital counseling? I have some questions for them that generally go along the lines of, is there any chance of restoration with your previous spouse? If they say there is none, then we have some other questions about this current circumstance. So I've participated in the no- in numbers of marriages of people who have been divorced. So please don't think I'm trying to draw a hard line on here. I'm not. But what I am trying to do is I think I'm training 120 biblical counselors here. That's what I perceive myself doing. And I would like you to be among those who say, everybody knows divorce is available. I don't need to recommend it. Did you catch that? Everybody knows that's an option. But the second that a Christ follower says, well, you know, things are pretty tough. Maybe divorce is the way. We add to an an increasing load of people who say that. So the church's position was two reasons, marital unfaithfulness, and that was generally perceived as some sort of sexual infidelity, adultery. One party or the other slept with somebody during their marriage, and it was discovered. So that offended party could divorce them and remarry. Or if there was desertion, then the person could remarry. Okay? Well, now... We're 450 years later, what, how the church has interpreted that is that marital unfaithfulness keeps being broadened. Okay, well, my husband looked at some pornography. My wife read a romance novel. My wife held the hand of another guy at work. And we keep expanding the definition of marital unfaithfulness. So rather than having two causes, we've got several. And then we expand it and say, well... There was certainly no woman involved with my husband, but he's got an affair with his job. Or he's got an affair with a bottle. So we keep expanding the list, don't we? So the list is getting pretty long. And guys, what I find is there are literally people in Billings that would not, they would no more come to my office than fly to the moon because I have this stance that just says, I'm not going to recommend to you to divorce. And the reason is, almost everybody else is. I have churches in my beloved city of Billings where if it looks at all messy, that's their default position. Well, you guys have a right to be happy. You have a right to be happy, so pull the plug and we'll do our best to help you kind of put something back. You need to get on with your life. That's the phrase. You need to get on with your life. Well, boy, guys, I think that's easy. And I wonder sometimes if it's because churches are so understaffed and they know that this couple here, it might take a year to put things back together and I just don't have the time and the resources to do it, so it's just easier to tell you to split the sheets. But I would like to talk to you guys about maybe let's refrain from that. Let's, let's refrain from that being our default position. So, flip the page. I wrote a paper. It's one of the few papers I've ever written. <clears throat> and here it is in outline form. Why I personally never recommend or encourage a person to divorce their mate. Now, you notice it says personally, and the word is recommend. That doesn't mean that I don't think there are times when it might be appropriate. It doesn't mean that there are times when 
I think even God would honor it, but I'm just not going to recommend it. And here are the reasons. First off, guys, write in the margin something you have written earlier in your book, grace, truth, and time. I have found, first of all, if you give enough grace to a circumstance and enough truth and enough time, I think most circumstances work out. There's some pretty good statistical evidence that even without any kind of counseling, most folks who go through marital troubles, if they just don't pull the plug, will eventually survive and be generally pretty happy. Grace, truth, and time. Okay, number one. How can I, as a follower of Christ, recommend in good conscience something that God says he hates, which is what he says in Malachi chapter 2, verse 16? How can I do that? I don't think I can. Does it mean that, again, it's necessarily wrong? But how can I jump on a bandwagon when God says he hates it? Number two, is there a strong support from the scripture, Jewish literature, historical background, and immediate context that the exception clause of marital unfaithfulness, Greek porneia, mentioned by Jesus in Matthew 5.32 and Matthew 19.9, referred to technically illegal marriages prohibited by the Hebrew law of holiness? Thus, a person who discovered porneia during the betrothal period could legitimately dissolve the union on the grounds that it was, uh, and I'll talk about that in a moment. You guys know what a betrothal period was? At the time of Jesus, a betrothal period looked like this. Somehow, Joan's parents and my parents start to talk about us getting of age. Joan and I might know each other a little, we might not. But they'd say they think we're a good match. At this point, I probably have not seen Joan's face, because, of course, what do they wear in the Mideast? A burka, right? So at some point, my dad says, why don't you propose? And I would go to Joan's house with a little entourage, and I'd have a little glass of wine that I would pour her, and one for me. And if I gave the glass of wine to her and she drank the wine, she accepted my proposal, and we were betrothed, which was a legal, le legally binding status. Betrothal could only be broken by divorce. I then said, thank you very much, see you soon, and I would go back to my village or my house, and I would begin to work on my premises. I would build a house or attach something to my dad's or do something so that Joan and I would have a place to live. The idea was that sometimes, sometime in the future, usually 9 to 12 months later, I'm going to show up at Joan's house with my entourage, and we're going to throw a big party, big party, week-long party. Those guys really knew how to party, and it was a big deal. Okay, During that betrothal period, we had basically no contact. Okay, So it's not engagement, it was betrothal. And so at that time, that's what went on. Now, does anybody know on what day of the week Jewish weddings took place? Almost always. Wednesday. And the reason was, divorce court was heard on Thursday. That's kind of interesting, isn't it? Wednesday was the wedding. Thursday was divorce court. And here's the reason. We've had the party. We're starting the party. Joan and I leave the party. We're at our little headquarters, wherever that is. I pull back her burqa, and it's not Joan, it's John. I've been duped. It's a guy. Pornea. That's one of the possible definitions of the word marital unfaithfulness or pornea. We go to the court the next day and say, I'm not marrying John. Okay? Number one. Number two, I pull back the veil and say, wow, Joan, didn't we used to play together at one time? I think you're my second cousin. Aren't you? That's why we go to divorce court next day. Close relationship. The third one was if I discovered that Joan wasn't a virgin. Marital unfaithfulness, pornea. We go to the divorce court. Now you think, well, let's see, how does that work? Any famous couple have that kind of funny circumstance? Joseph and Mary, maybe? They're betrothed. He finds out she's pregnant. And he says, well, I don't want to, I don't want to be a bad guy here. I will divorce her. Remember, they had slept together. I will divorce her and put her away quietly. Now, guys, can I prove that that's the meaning of the marital unfaithfulness clause? Absolutely not. 
I cannot prove it. I'm just saying that that is, that is a view that is held by some of us, okay? That divorce was never an issue once you tied the knot. Comments, thoughts? I'm glad they don't all have a tennis ball, Joan. Yes? Uh-huh. Okay. I had that postured to me the other day. Good question. Well, technically, you can't get it done. And so I, I use this as an example. And, and it's ridiculous because of who my wife is, but I, I use this as an example. <clears throat> A guy asked me, he says, what if, Fred, what if Joan cheated on you? And I said, I would be sad. He said, would you divorce her? And I said, no. And then he said... So you just let that continue. And I said, well, that isn't what I said. You didn't say it was continuing. If it continued, at some point, I would now begin to participate in her sin, right, if I allowed that. So at some point, I'd have to say, Joni, you and I can't live together as long as you choose to be with that other person. Just can't do it. Even if you say, I don't want a divorce, we're not going to do that. So I'm going to live over here, and you're going to live over here. What am I hoping will happen? That God will work and Joan will repent. Okay, Then the guy said, so you'd never divorce her. I would never divorce her. Well, what if she divorced you? I would be sad. I can't stop that. And then he said to me, he said, but Fred, you mean you're, you would allow Joan's bad behavior to affect your life like that? He said, would you remarry? And I said, no, I would not. And I said, and I don't think this has to be where everybody else would stand, but I would not because I never would know when Joan might repent. Well, by this time, the guy is very frustrated. <laughs> very frustrated. And he said, Fred, I just don't get it. Don't you have a right to a happy life? And I said, no, I don't have a right to a happy life. That's not what the Bible says. Life is about God, not about me. I don't have a right to a happy life. I'm sorry, guys. Maybe that's weird theology, but I can't find it in the Scripture. I think I'm going to have a happy life living that way. I'm not going to kid you. I think it's the way to live life big. He said, so in other words, you'd live sad and celibate for the rest of your life. And I said, oh, I don't think I'm going to be sad. I, I'm connected to the Lord of the universe. I, I'm not going to be sad at all forever. And then I asked him, I turned the table around. I said, you have a 16-year-old son who knows me pretty well. So let's imagine this circumstance has developed. And I take him to breakfast one day, and he says, so Uncle Fred, you mean Joan leaves you, she's unfaithful, and you're going to suffer the consequences? And I said, well, you know, son, we just need to be real choosy when we pick a mate because it's for life. Do you think that has impact on your 16-year-old son? There's some heads nodding right now. I said, what if an entire generation of Christ followers did that? What if an entire generation? Could we turn this kind of sad situation around right now, guys, that says that right now 50% of folks who say they follow Christ who marry will divorce, which is identical to the pagans. It's identical. So guys, I know it's a hard line, I know it's not a popular line, and I also agree that it's not even the majority. So throw it out the window if you want, but the guy asked me, and you asked me, so thank you. Okay, number two, number three, excuse me, well we're halfway through number two. Yes sir, yes sir. Well, you would think a guy that's studied something for 35 years should come to a solid conclusion. That's, that embarrasses me. But I just think the language is too vague, guys. I'm just embarrassed about it. I have read, in fact, I, I read a guy that I think is the world's greatest scholar's explanation of this the other day, and I thought, he doesn't know either. <laughs> he landed with both feet firmly planted in midair. <laughs> Number three. Divorce really doesn't work. Each of the parties simply carry their hurts, habits, and hang-ups to another relationship. Roughly 50% of the first marriages fail, 74% of second ones fail, and 84% of third marriages fail. It just doesn't work all that well, does it? Number four, divorce does irreparable damage to one's children. 
I shared with you before, guys, my concern. But if anyone causes one of these little ones who trust in me to lose faith, it would be better for that person to be thrown into the sea with a large millstone tied around the neck. Guys, I can't say that every time somebody divorces, they just devastate their kids. But they do hurt their kids. There's no question. And I think there, there are wounds that the kids never quite recover from. And then number six. No, excuse me, number five. Divorce is a terrible witness to the non-believing world. If anyone says, I am living in the light, but hates a Christian brother or sister, that person is still living in darkness. Anyone who loves other Christians is living in the light and does not cause anyone to stumble. Guys, a Christ follower's life is based on love and on sacrifice. And it needs to begin with that person sleeping next to us in our bed. Number six. Divorce hurts other struggling marriages. The greatest hindrance I have in talking people out of a divorce are their friends who tell them how happy they are since they have divorced and remarried. So guys, I'm going to be real frank. I have dozens of friends who are divorced, remarried, and have wonderful, robust Christian lives where they're great witnesses and they're raising great kids. I've seen it. But the very fact that those exist makes it a lot harder to talk somebody out of a divorce. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, I have this lovely staff. One of the highlights of my life right now is working with the little staff that I have underneath me, and they are just tremendous. So this is our stance, my stance that they've now inherited. Ultimately, I never recommend divorce. I labor with all God's resources to help struggling couples who seek my assistance to save their marriages, and if a couple divorces, I endeavor to love both parties. And guys, I kind of put my money where the, my mouth is. I have a couple that I've worked with for about a year and a half. Um, I really like these guys, but he won't stay out of the bars. He will not stay out of the bars, so he's on a fair number five. He still wants to keep it together, but he isn't willing to give up drinking. So she told me the other day, Fred, I'm done, and we don't have a dime. Would you help us divorce? And I said, certainly. Bear one another's burdens and thus fulfill the law of Christ. She said, do you want to talk me out of it? I said, are you asking for my advice? She said, no. Okay, come on over. <laughs> I'm not going to give somebody my counsel unless they ask it, and she's not asking. She asked if I would help them divorce, and I will. And I'll do it for a couple of reasons. One is I think it honors the Lord to love people. Number two is I'm going to get to talk to both parties about how they can diminish the damage to their children, and they have almost nothing if, if I help them they may very well have a little bit left to get started. So I'm going to serve them and love both parties. Does that make any sense at all? Okay, questions, thoughts? Yes, sir. How do you cast counsel when you have somebody that's in an abusive relationship or their spouse is physically or sexually abusing their kids? Yeah. Uh, well, of course, on some of that, the law is going to intervene, aren't they? If the law is involved, they're going to separate them, and they'll have restraining orders and so on. And I just do my best to stay out of the way of the law. I, I get in trouble every once in a while. In fact, I understand that I've got an attorney over at the city who's real mad at me because he thinks I'm making end runs around his restraining orders, and I'm not. If I am aware that the couple has a restraining order against each other, I won't see him. But the fact is, I have no way of knowing. And people, what did I tell you about lies? I got people lying to me all the time. So, so if the law is involved, that takes care of one situation. But let's take the situation where a person is being abused. And the most recent one was where the man was being physically abused by the woman. Gal was pretty tough. Man, she really conked him the other day. He called the police and had her kicked out of the house and so on. Would I have separated them? Yeah, I would have. But there's a difference then between separation and divorce, isn't there? In my mind, couples can separate for purpose of restoration. What's the purpose of divorce? Separation, isn't it? So on frequent occasions, I've asked an offended spouse, make sure your, your, your spouse who's offending you and, and breaking your vow on a recurrent basis is now out of your home. And if they won't move, because sometimes you can't get them to move, then you have to be prepared to move. And in my opinion, the body of Christ has to now step up and help that person. Because oftentimes finances become the issue. Did I answer that question for you? Does that make sense? Okay. 
of course, the next question is, how long do you wait, right? That's, that's your call. Greatest minds in the world haven't figured that one out. Anybody else? You won't know. You just won't know. I think there are some signs, but there is no guarantee. Joan doesn't know that I wouldn't become abusive tonight. That's why my sword is such a vivid image, right? <laughs> Marriage is a risk. Anybody else? Good questions, by the way, guys. Anybody else? Okay. We're in good shape. Guys, on page 78, I had a lady a few months back say, Fred, my husband came in the other night. He'd just been neglectful. He's been mean-spirited. He drinks too much. He came in the other night, and he had alcohol on his breath, and I just saw him, and I was disgusted, and I went in and locked the bedroom door and went to bed. What should I have done? I think it's a great question. It's a great question. And I don't falter at all. I mean, that's naturally what a person would do. But it did prompt some thought process for me. I thought, okay, Jesus certainly had some people that treated him poorly. He certainly had some folks that he would have considered his enemies. And I thought, who would have been the person who would have been hardest for Jesus to love? Now, I, I think you could come up with a pretty long list. But the guy that came to my mind was Judas. And so, guys, about halfway down that page, I've got the scripture there that you can read some of this, but here's what it says. Judas was a satanically influenced thief, fraud, and traitor. Is that a fair statement? Certainly he was satanically influenced. He was a thief. He kept stealing from the company bag, right? He was a fraud. He really wasn't a true disciple of Jesus, and then he became a traitor. Arguably, this would have been a hard guy to love. What do you think? Okay, how did Jesus love Judas? He included him in his inner circle of friends, he treated him with dignity, and he served him. That has to be a typographical error. Or is that true? Is that how G Jesus treated Judas? Was Jesus buffaloed by him, by the way, guys? Did Jesus know that Judas was going to be a traitor? Seems pretty early on he does. Huh, interesting. Those who claim to live in him must walk as Jesus did. Huh. Did Judas respond well to our Lord's grace? I think the answer is obviously not. Did Judas' subsequent betrayal surprise Jesus? Uh-uh. Then why would Jesus surrender his love, squander his love on Judas? Could we read that together? Because it honored his heavenly Father. Would you circle that? Why would we love people who betray us? because it honors God. Is there a Judas in your life? Would you cross out the word life? Is there a Judas in your bed? And how did Jesus love Judas? So we make it our goal to please him. Would you guys circle the word goal? So we make it our goal to please him, whether at home in the body or away from it, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Would you circle the words, appear before the judgment seat of Christ? That each one may receive what is due him for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. I have an article that I keep in my file and I look at every once in a while. It's called Wise Christians Clip Obituaries. Wise Christians clip obituaries. I try to look at the obituaries several times a week, and I always look at the pictures and think, did anybody that's on this page last week think they'd be in the obituaries? And you know, in most cases, even the real elderly really don't. They think they got a little while longer, don't they? But the fact is, guys, life's short. Whether you get to live 30 years or 50 years or 95 years, life is really just a blink. And then there we are, as followers of Jesus, the judgment seat of Christ, and that's where everything is going to be vindicated. If we've been treated poorly here, guys, it's all going to get squared away. If our spouse didn't treat us quite the way we had planned on, 
It's all going to get taken care of, and it's going to be done so justly and perfectly. We never have to vindicate ourselves. Our job is to love people, to will the very best for them. Guys, on page 79. <clears throat> Many aspire, but few attain. We're now going to talk about discipleship. How do we make sure that we're strong? Guys, everybody needs to be in fellowship, and there's three forms of fellowship. You need a good Bible teaching church that you're in, in at least once a week that you become involved in, where you hear good preaching and teaching about the Word of God. It's mandatory, guys. You're going to go down the tubes if you don't have it. Number two is you need a good life-giving small group. There's a lot of ways to accomplish that, but you've got to have a group that's small enough that people get to know you. You know, guys, I go to a Saturday night service at Harvest Church. There's 712 or something that have been showing up at that service. A person can come into there, and it'll be just like at a movie. You can come in. You can even have a snack and listen to some great preaching and leave and not have any accountability at all. So if you're going to be accountable, if you're going to be voluntarily accountable, you've got to have some folks that know you. So if you don't have a small group, talk to the pastor of your church and say, how do we get this done? There's some of you guys that have learned this kind of secret of putting together a covenant group. I think the Oaklands, I think my daughter Steph, I think Brandon, a lot of these guys could help you in that process. Number three is a committed mentor. Guys, I had one primary goal before I left, or as I left Streeter Brothers, and it was to accomplish the following. I believe every Christian couple needs a mentor or a mentoring couple and that eventually they need to mentor someone else. Did you catch that? Every Christian couple needs a mentor or a mentoring couple that they can go to that over the long haul knows them well enough that they can ask hard questions. And then ultimately we need to turn around and do that same favor for somebody else. I love the concept. So my 75 couples, I meet with most of them once a month. They have access to Joan and myself 24-7, and they use that. They call. We visit. One of the calls I had on the way up to was, was one of our couples. The guy's got a, a neat job opportunity, but he wanted to run it by me, and so we'll spend a few, ne weeks ne or a few minutes next week going over that possibility. Just wants to, to know. And the fun thing is I've now known the guy for five years. He doesn't have to reinvent the wheel. That makes sense? Okay, so at our meetings, let's imagine it's Chris and Katie here. They're sitting there. I ask them three things. Guys, is everything okay? You got any precancerous cells in your relationship? So I give them a chance to, to catch up on anything that's not going well. Second of all, do you have any questions from your Bible? Now, this one's pretty important to me. If a couple comes to one of those meetings two times in a row without questions, I talk to them about maybe this not being such a good deal. Because if you read your Bible and you read it in depth, you're going to have questions. <laughs> and since I'm training up the next generation, i, I got to have you read in your Bible. So that's number two. And then number three, I have four manuals. There's 500 of these kinds of handouts that are designed to take those couples to become full-service Christians. I want to be able to call the Schwans and say, hey, you guys, i got a couple that need to know Jesus. Could you, you, could you lay out the gospel for them? They're, they're ready. I want to be able to call them and say, hey, i got a guy that's demon-possessed. He's out on the West End. Here's his address. Can you go get that guy taken care of? And have the guy say, yeah, I know how to do that. That's how I want to train them. Full-service Christians. Prayer. God talks to you. Listening prayer, we've talked about that concept of asking the Lord questions. Lord, is there any sin in my life that I'm not aware of? How do I be a better husband? How do I be a better wife, better parent, better friend? You talk to God. I have people ask this, and they always use the parking place. I don't know why they always do. You're one of those guys that prays for parking places. I said, oh, yeah, I do. I, whenever I'm driving around and I need a parking place, I pray. I pray for that. I pray for peace in Iraq. I pray for my marriage. I pray for you. Because my Bible says, in, a, in Philippians chapter 4, verse 6, it says, don't worry about anything, but pray about everything. Worry is a sin, isn't it? Don't worry about anything, but pray about everything. And then we need to ingest the Word. And I mean ingest it. 
I have folks <clears throat> take their palm and put it on a piece of paper, and I have them trace their fingers and then their thumb and their whole palm. So that's where we are. And then I say, guys, this is where we read the Word. This is where we hear the Word. Here's where we study the Word. Here's where we memorize the Word. And this is the thing that really is going to help us. Have you ever tried to grasp anything without a thumb? Not much work getting done. The thumb is the key, and this is where we meditate on God's Word. And the best way to meditate on it is to memorize it. Okay, let's take a passage. Let's show you how it's done. Close your eyes. Close your eyes. Psalms 119, 23 and 24. Can you say that? You guys are getting tired. Okay, here we go. 119, 23 and 24. This is what it says. You ready? Though uh, rulers stand together, sit together, and slander me. The rulers sit together. Can you imagine those people? We all got about a 3% of our population that's mad at us. The rulers sit together and slander me. I will meditate on your decrees. That's the word. I'm going to meditate on that. That's when, I, when I got rough things going on in my life, I'm going to meditate on your word. I delight in your statutes, in your word, Lord. I delight in it. This is what makes me happy. I delight in your statutes. They are my counselors. Isn't that beautiful, guys? You know, you can't have your mentor with you all the time. You can't pack around your church, but you know what you can pack around with you all the time? is the counsel of the Word. Next page, page 80, is a frequent question about the church. I'd like you to read that. People ask, do I have to go to church? And there's my answer. Page 81. Scripture reading plan. Guys, if you've got a great scripture reading plan that works for you, just keep doing it. There's no right or right way or wrong way. But if you don't have a scripture reading plan, here's one I like. Read one chapter of Psalms and one chapter of the following New Testament books Monday through Saturday. So you read a chapter of Psalms, and then you read a chapter of Matthew. Then you read the next chapter of Matthew with another psalm the next day, reading thoughtfully, meditatively, and so on. Then you come down to Acts. So you're still going to be in Psalms somewhere in that vicinity, and you're going to read a chapter in Acts, another chapter in Acts, until you finish Acts. When you've read the New Testament six times, it's going to start to make great sense. And that's going to take you about two and a half to three years. It's a pretty steep learning curve at first. I know a lot of you are going to say, man, I'm just overwhelmed. Just keep banging away at it. And find people to ask questions. Because the day you step over that, when that starts to flatten out and you're saying, wow, I now, I now know what Fred's talking about. This word, it's my delight. But it's going to be a little while. The next page, guys, is the navigators have given me permission to copy their topical memory system. Here were the first 60-some verses that Joan and I memorized together. We pick one passage a week. We memorize that passage. Then we put that one away temporarily when we memorize a new one. And so we're always memorizing a new one, reviewing an old one. Memorizing a new one, reviewing an old one. So every passage gets a couple of weeks. Now, people get discouraged. They say, but Fred, don't you forget them? Oh, yeah. Believe me. Joan and I have memorized at some point in time about 6,000 passages of Scripture. How many could I do word perfect? 250. 250, maybe. That's discouraging, but I'm obviously not that bright. So 250 passages of Scripture I can memorize word perfect. How many could I get close? Oh, well, 3,000 close. And how many of them did me good? All 6,000. So don't be discouraged by the fact that you forget one. Marriage Mentor Guide. Now, there are some of you that need to be mentored right now, and some of you that need to be mentors. So here's what I ask. I had a young couple that's about to get married. And um, quite frankly, guys, I think they got a shaky start. I think they do. But, but they meet the criteria, and we love them, and we're going to try to help them out. I called a couple that I really admire the other day, and I said, you guys ready to get in the saddle? Because I need a mentor. And so we talked about what that looked like, and here are the two pages that I faxed them, this one and the next one. 
The basic commitment of a marriage mentoring couple looks like this. Meet for an evening at least once per month to review the sanity check, which is below, and the marriage tips, which is the next page. Pray for your friends and their children daily. Touch bases with them at least twice per month by phone. Plan some just-for-fun event with your couple at least once per quarter. And make yourself available to your friends any time they might have a question to answer, a squabble to mediate, etc. Now, the couple that I asked, they said, that sounds like some work. Oh, yeah, yeah, it's work. Well, does it ever get messy? Oh, yeah, ministry is messy. Because the people are going to call you at about 11.15. That's when the wheels fall off because they don't obey the principle at the bottom of the next page. You see what that principle is? Keep your conversations light between the hours of 9 p.m. and 9 a.m. They break that particular principle. We have a saying in our household, after 9 o'clock, sex and Seinfeld, nothing else. <laughs> okay? Sex and Seinfeld, no deep conversations. You guys are awake. That's good. That's good. Okay, so how's it look? If I was a young couple, if I was these guys right here, they're kind of cute, aren't they? they got, I'd like these guys. I think they need to go. Do you guys go to Journey Church? Okay. I'd be looking around. I'd be looking around saying, who really seems to know how to be married? And then I'd take them to breakfast someday, and I'd say, hey, would you guys mentor us? Would you be our couple? Would you be our go-to people? And don't let them off the hook. Don't let them off the hook. Because the most fun thing they'll ever do in their life is mentor you two guys. They'll never do anything more rewarding. They'll never do anything more fun. At Harvest Church, you can't get married, at least unless we know it, <clears throat> unless you commit to meeting with a mentoring couple for the first two years. That's a commitment you have to make. Now, it's an on-your-honor deal, and I can't make people do it. But here's what I find, is at the end of two years, nobody quits. It's too much fun for the mentee and the mentor. They just keep right on trucking. Joan and I had dinner two weeks ago with our mentors, Gene and Jan Hennifer. And I will still always remember hunting poor Doc Hennifer down. Um, they had two daughters, delightful girls. One of them lives up here in Bozeman. Many of you know, might know her, Leslie Doc, and just a delightful gal, and her sister, Cheryl. And they went to Billings West High. And we had just had Steph. She's just getting to be a little, like a little one-and-a-half-year-old, and then we were pregnant again, and we kind of suspected that was a girl. And so I'm getting panicked. I'm thinking, I don't know about this raising girls. And then I looked at these two girls, and so I asked Cheryl one day, I said, what's your dad's name? She says, uh, uh, Dr. Hennifer, Gene Hennifer. And I said, oh, cool. Where does he go to church? The Faith Evangelical. We didn't even go to that church. I says, where does he sit? He said, well, kind of over the side. And I said, okay, great. So John and I went to that church and sat right next to him in, in service. And so at the kind of that fellowship hour, I, I'm Fred Nelson. I wondered if I could take you to breakfast. No, I think we're pretty busy. <laughs> Did it five times. Five Sundays in a row, I asked this guy <laughs> to go to breakfast. Finally, I think he feels like he's cornered. He said, is this Amway? Are you trying to sell me Amway? <laughs> And, and he's not a particularly tall guy, and I put my hands on his shoulder, and I says, you raised some good girls. I want to know how to do that. Can we just go to breakfast? Well, that started a friendship, guys, that has been a blast. I think my daughters think of them as their grandparents. They're just great friends. And, guys, they saved us all manner of trouble. I can't tell you how many times we made a call to them and says, what do you think? It kept Joan and I from having problems. I think it kept us from making big mistakes with our kids. It was a great system, just a great system. Now, some of the others of you, I'm looking at the Schwans here. These guys are pretty mature. You know, I think they kind of get it. <laughs> if I were them, I'd be looking for some talent. I consider myself a talent scout. I'm always looking for talent. And so there's probably not much more fun in the world than to have a couple come up to you and say, I've been watching you. I think you kind of get it. Could we begin to spend some time with you? And could we have the privilege of sharing some of the stuff that was shared with us years ago? A passage of scripture I'd like you to write the reference down is 2 Timothy 2.2, and it says this. The things you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, these entrust to faithful men and women who will be able to teach others also. John Oakland calls this the giant pyramid scheme. 
And that it is. Guys, I'm participating in this wonderful, giant pyramid scheme that the God of the universe calls discipleship. Pouring our lives into the next generation. You guys have given me a great privilege. For eight hours, can you believe it? Eight hours. Man. Had a sweet bunch of people that have allowed me to pour into them. Thanks. Thanks.